So looking this morning at the first 16 verses of 1 Kings 16, we're talking about when supplies dwindle. Just thinking, I wonder how many of us would have imagined about four or five months ago that there would be a critical shortage of toilet paper, of all things. Totally surprised me. Thinking about things that would be in short supply, that's one I would have never imagined. Now, thankfully, you go to the store these days and uh, there's, there's not that shortage. So, But during that time, uh, I, I think we all probably were a bit concerned about how bare the shelves were for a while. Like bread and meat and canned goods and flour and pretty much anything you can think of seemed to be in short supply. I guess we still have the signs that say you're limited to one or two of certain items, so I guess it's still there. But uh, no doubt that came as a great shock to all of us because we are so used to having what we want in a wide variety of options and always in abundance. So seeing bare store shelves was quite a shock. And maybe that was a good thing for us if we, we learned some lessons. Because I think that when things are in abundance, we very easily trust the supply rather than the supplier. It's good to know that God is the supplier. So when supplies dwindle, we are drawn back to focusing more on the supplier as we ought to. So with that, let's look at the first six verses of 1 Kings chapter 17. We started into this a bit last week. But we're told that Elijah the Tishbite, who was one of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, Ahab was the king, he said, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain for these years except by my word. The word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself in the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. It shall be that you will drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he would drink from the brook. I think that about the only thing I have in common with Elijah is that we both came from some very small towns. This town that he came from, a lot of people don't even know where it would be today, geography-wise, a very unknown town. I relate to that. I came from a very small rural Indiana town by the name of Hedrick that at its best had about 50 people population-wise. But I learned something interesting about it. It used to be about twice that size. It used to be a town of about 100 until the year 1922 when a tornado came through and destroyed the town. I thought you might find it a little bit interesting as a side note to town I came from that talks about a cyclone that wipes out the settlement known as, I've mentioned this before, Soul Sleeper Corner. How interesting. There were two churches there. It mentions that across from one, a Pleasant View Christian church, stood the Soul Sleepers Church, a frame building. That was kind of a derogatory phrase attached to the early believers in my hometown, they were known for the sleep of the dead, biblically. And so that was even known in the community, that little corner known as Soul Sleeper Corner. That little church was destroyed by a tornado. So that's just a little side note about my hometown, Hedrick, Indiana. So God called Elijah from his little small town, called him to the palace of the king. That's quite a leap for this man coming out of a small town. I wonder how he got through security. Nevertheless, he came in and apparently had an audience with King Ahab. God gave Elijah a one-sentence message to deliver to the king. 
And basically that message was, it is going to stop raining for a few years upon the word that Elijah would declare that God told him to declare. James chapter 5 verse 17 tells us that it was three and a half years that it did not rain. God's judgment upon a wicked people. So three and a half years, no rain. No monsoon season. No December winter rains. Not even any dew in the morning. So in essence, it's going to get drier than the Arizona desert. So I want you to notice a couple things about what God had told Elijah to share. First of all, a drought is a sign of God's judgment. Time and time again, especially in the Old Testament, we find that when God was displeased with his people, he would send a devastating drought. Secondly, and this I think is a very interesting side note, the people of Israel uh, had defected away from worshiping Yahweh God, and they were largely, for whatever reason, bowing down to a false god by the name of Baal. And so Baal, if you know anything of history, was known as a god of fertility, but along with that he was also considered as a god of rain. So when God used Elijah to say there is not going to be any rain for three and a half years, this really puts the test on the false god. Because if Baal is a god of rain, then he ought to cause it to rain. That ought to circumvent the judgment that God had brought upon them. Elijah himself was not immune to the judgment that he had pronounced that day before the king. So this very serious drought that was about to be unleashed was going to affect him. And so God had a mission for Elijah right after that one sentence statement. And that was that God wanted him to go to a specific brook in a deserted place. So in a sense, Elijah came out of obscurity. He delivered the message of the Lord. And, and now he's kind of gone off for a little period of retirement in an area of obscurity. And so he's going to be by a brook where he will have ample water for a time. The second thing that I notice in the story here, which is really rather outrageous, and that is that God has a way that he is miraculously going to provide food for Elijah. He is going to send ravens twice a day to bring him food. Nothing could be more out of the ordinary than that. If we know anything at all, about ravens, we're not talking Baltimore ravens, we're talking about birds as in Edgar Allan Poe's poem, The Raven. Ravens are vultures. I for one, if I were in Elijah's shoes, would be very suspicious of any food a raven would bring to me. Because there's a pretty good chance that what the raven's going to bring is the critter of the day or some roadkill stew, but I wouldn't count on a raven to bring especially good food, but yet that's the unconventional way whereby God is going to provide for Elijah. And so he's going to bring him bread and meat twice a day. Again, I'd be a little suspicious at least of the meat, but presumably God had the ravens bring fresh meat and fresh bread, a miraculous way in which God provided for Elijah the prophet. So according to our verses, we read that all went well for a period of time. So Elijah is safely off, after making that pronouncement to the king, safely off in a place of hiding, and for more ways than one, because no doubt the king and queen are not terribly happy with this man of God, and so no doubt they have a desire to kill him and to harm him, and so God has whisked him off to a place of safety. All seems to go well. But then we get to verse 7, and it says that it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. So God sent him off to that place. There's fresh water for a period of time. But I'm thinking that the brook probably did not just dry up overnight. And I'm just wondering about how Elijah has a test of his faith over perhaps a period of days, weeks, and even months as he's watching the brook get down less and less water over a period of time until eventually there's nothing left. And so no doubt watching that on a regular basis, watching the supply dwindle 
again, had to be a significant challenge to the faith of this man of God. There is an application. Someone made this statement, and I think this kind of brings it home to us. We all have to stay by a drying brook sooner or later. It may be the drying brook of popularity, or the drying brook of failing health, or a sick loved one, or a failing career, or the drying brook of a friendship that is slowly fading away. So we think about the drying brooks that we have been by in our own lives. We've all faced a type of a crisis as Elijah faced as well. And so when we see those kinds of things happening, whatever our drying brook is, there is the opportunity to look to God in greater faith. What next, God? You've led thus far, you've provided thus far, but what's your next move? And as we ask such a question, as we wait, we wait in faith. However long Elijah was in that remote place by that brook, he had plenty of time to see God providing on a daily basis. Again, the ravens, that had to be an amazing thing. Twice a day he's reminded of his God that provided for him all the while he's there by that brook, even if it was beginning to dry up. Nevertheless, he sees God miraculously providing for him. And so again, a great opportunity for his faith to grow. Come back to the ravens again for just a moment. Because I think it is very, very interesting that Jesus so happened to speak about faith and trust in terms of ravens in the Sermon on the Mount recorded specifically in Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 24. Matthew's account of the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about the birds of the air. But I find it very interesting in Luke's account, chapter 12, verse 24, Jesus says, Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They don't have a storehouse or a barn, yet God feeds them. Aren't you worth much more than the birds? I wonder if Jesus had in mind this great story about Elijah when he referred to the ravens. So not only does God provide for the ravens, God provides for us. And again, Elijah had a daily opportunity to see how God miraculously provides. So verses 8 and 9. It says, The word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering. I'm going to stop the story just a little bit because we want to get into that here in just a moment. But just verses 8 and 9, where he's commanded to go to that particular town. We're told a town by the name of Zarephath, if I pronounce it correctly, a very small town in the region of Sidon, and that would be in the region of modern-day Lebanon, if you've got a map and, and look at that. And so he was called north of the land of Israel. And an interesting thing about the region of Sidon, where God had specifically directed Elijah to go, that just so happened to be the very region where the wicked Queen Jezebel had come from. So if Baal worship, which to me idol worship is such a bizarre thing to try to wrap my mind around anyway, but if Baal worship was a big deal in the land of Israel, then the region of Sidon where the queen came from, who initiated so much of this, he literally was called to the capital city of this kind of idol worship. So now God is going to provide for Elijah, as he says according to his word, and it would seem that if God was going to provide for Elijah, that he must have sent him to the wrong place and to the wrong individual. Because to our way of thinking, if God's going to provide for Elijah, it ought to be somebody who had some resources to share. And I would think he would have called him to some wealthy businessman or landowner. That would be a pretty good choice. The absolute worst choice, it would seem that God could have made, would have been this poor widow and her only son. Nevertheless, that's exactly who God has sent him to. So pick up in verse 10 that I started to read. He arose, he went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the city, behold, there was a widow that was gathering sticks. And it says that he called to her and said, Please get me a little water in a jar that I may drink. As she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. 
But she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl, and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I'm gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Again, doesn't it seem like a rather bad choice of God to have sent Elijah to this poor widow who's down to the last little bit of resource? They were literally down to their last meal. But yet, God had said to Elijah, I have commanded a widow to provide for you. Again, it would be very easy to think that God got his signals crossed. But this is all part of the ongoing story of faith, and that's what this is really about. God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong, 1 Corinthians 1.27. And concerning faith. Now, faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen, Hebrews 11.1. 1. And without faith, we know, it is impossible to please God, Hebrews 11, verse 6. So verses 13 to 16, Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go, do as you have said, but make me a little bread cake from it first and bring it out to me, and afterward you may make one for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty, until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. So she went and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah." It's not just about Elijah living by faith and operating by faith. We see here that the challenge of faith extends to this poor widow. And what a dilemma it must have been for her. Here she's getting everything ready to make that one last meal. And that's going to be it for her and her son. And Elijah makes this outrageous request. What I want you to do is make something for me first. And then keep the rest for yourself. And so what a real challenge to faith to her as well. Reminds me of Ecclesiastes 11.1. 1, Cast your bread on the surface of the waters, for you will find it after many days. That's pretty much what she's being asked to do. In faith, cast your bread out there and see if God will not bless. Also reminds me of the great tithing passage in Malachi 3.10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house, and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven, pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. And that's the similar kind of challenge to faith. Bring something to me first. Bring the first fruits to me as an act of faith and see if I will not bless you. So we admire the faith of this woman because it says that she went and did according to the word of Elijah. We'd have to back up and try to put ourselves in her shoes. Would we have done the same thing? Or would it have been easy enough to say resources are extremely limited, supplies very limited? Sorry, but I just can't do that. But she did so, and, and the food was multiplied for a great amount of time, it says. And it reminds me of a similar miracle that would take place between eight and nine hundred years after what we read about here when Jesus would do something very similar taking some loaves and some fish multiplying to feed five thousand men plus their families and later on four thousand men plus their families something of Elijah and what Jesus did at that time reflecting on these verses that we look at here this morning I think one of the great lessons is how God prepares his people I certainly see that with Elijah the prophet. We also see that with the widow as well. In this chapter, in these verses we looked at, they cover about three years of the life of Elijah the prophet. And we might say that was about the amount of time that he went to college out in the wilderness. Three years is pretty close to the time of a college education. And someone has called this going to school at Dry Brook University. 
And I suppose we might think of it that way, where Elijah's character is being formed. His faith is growing as he watches God provide for him during that amount of time. So a very important time of preparation in a significant prophet of God. And it comes down to each of us thinking that so much of our life, maybe most of our life, is that of preparation. Most of our life is getting us ready. Learning and cultivating faith and developing godly character as God wants it in our lives. Thinking back to a rather smug attitude I had as a senior in high school. And I had sensed God's call upon my life that he wanted me to be involved in ministry, whatever that was about. That was a totally foreign thing to me at that point. But nevertheless, I felt a strong call. And I had a great desire to hit the ground running. And I thought, well, I guess i got to do this Bible college thing, but that's kind of a waste of time because I'm ready to go now, God. And I look back and I realize I've never really left college even this many years later. It wasn't just about three, four years of college training. It's about a lifetime of preparation still, going to school, trying to learn the lessons that God has for me. And perhaps you can say the same thing for you. A couple passages in First and Second Peter that really talk about the development of character that fits so well with what we look at here. First Peter 1, verses 6 and 7, the Apostle Peter says, Now for a short time you have had to struggle in various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, more valuable than gold, which perishes through, though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The development of character. And 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 to 8, he says, Make every effort, I like that, make every effort, be diligent about this, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, and goodness with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Character development rings loud and clear in those verses. And again, thinking of three years in the life of Elijah, God developing his character. We know so much about him largely because of those three years in obscurity. And so that's the secret in our lives as well. God taking us to those secret places where we can learn and, and where character can be formed. And so such times are important. It's been said that there are three words that summarize well the lessons of 1 Kings 17 that we've looked at today. The word command, the word obedience, and the word provision. The command of the Lord, what God says. And of course the response to that of obedience, to do what God says. And following on the heels of that, how God provides when we take his commands seriously and obey them and how God comes through and does what God uniquely can do. As we read about Elijah, that he did what the Lord commanded. And it says how Elijah got up and went to Zarephath. And then this poor widow, that she proceeded to do according to the word of Elijah. And so it really is about obeying what God says, acting in faith. Again, I come back to the theme of faith. Because so much of it is acting in faith. And so it is in our lives, operating by faith. And one of the things about it is that rarely are the details of God's plans revealed in advance. Think about that in terms of Elijah. God didn't tell him the whole story at the start. He didn't say, Elijah, you're going to go off over there for about three years in a place of obscurity, and eventually the water's going to run out. I'm going to stop the ravens from feeding you, and, and so here's the plan. You're going to go to this city, to this, this widow, and be provided for. He didn't tell him that in advance. It was all on a need-to-know basis. And isn't that the way it is with us as well? That is the journey of faith, that God speaks, and, and we respond, and we go, but there's so much that we don't know. He doesn't give us all the details, because that's how it works with faith. Along with that, God's leading sometimes involves sudden changes. I go back to Abraham, a man that we greatly respect. 
And how God called Abraham to very suddenly change course, to leave the comfort of a city where he'd lived in for years, to go to a land that he didn't even know. The details were not provided other than, I just want you to pick up and I want you to go. A very sudden change. And we think about that in terms of Elijah. Here he's been in this place of obscurity by the brook. All of a sudden God says, I want you to pull up stakes. I want you to head up north. And I want you to suddenly go. I've got new orders for you, a new direction. And you know, that's the way it is in our lives as well as people who walk by faith. There are times when God calls us to a sudden change. We can be very comfortable in what it is that we're doing, but suddenly it's a new job. It's a new community. It's a new situation. It's a new opportunity. In the journey of faith, there are times when God calls us to make a very sudden move. We live in a culture where we're largely insulated from shortages, to go back to where we started a little while ago. We had just a bit of a sample of what it's like to experience shortage. We do well to learn from Elijah concerning faith, concerning obedience, concerning how God provides. And we might add to that, Matthew chapter 6 is a great supplemental chapter to look at as well, as we also learn the lessons of faith and how God provides for his people.